Why do all ceramic crowns fracture? You have to remember there are different ways of making ceramic crowns. One is monolithic crowns and the other is what they call a layered buildup. So where they lay a veneering porcelain over a stronger substrate like zirconia or lithium to silicate. So many of these layered porcelains, we have seen cases where you see chipping of the restoration, chipping of the crown. And it's very annoying for us as dentists when the patient comes back and you see it chipped with a porcelain and you hope that's not gonna cause the patient a problem in your court and you're hoping that you don't have to redo the restoration. But how often does that happen? You know, Sailor in 2015 did a systematic review and they found about 3% of the cases may get this chipping of the, of the veneering porcelain after five years. And you might ask, why do we get this chipping from this porcelain fused to zirconia? One of the main reasons is that originally the cores were not well supported. So the actual zirconia coping is not supporting the veneering porcelain. It could be that that you as a dentist have done some occlusal adjustment and you haven't highly polished the restoration and you've got these little micro fractures that over time they get some aging with water and you get some, some fractures of the veneering porcelain. And in the past when they, when they first developed um, porcelain infused zirconia, we didn't have very good matching of the thermal coefficients of thermal expansion between veneering porcelain and zirconia. So this difference in coefficient led to some fractures as well. But we have to remember that the dental technician, and sometimes as a dentist, we don't see this, but the dental technician ceramist, they need to support the veneering porcelain correctly. So you see in this example, that zirconia coping is not supporting that thick layer of veneering porcelain. So when the patient occludes on that cusp, you might see that fracture because it's not well supported. What about monolithic restorations? Now, these materials range from 400 up to 1100 megapascals in flexural strength, so they're very, very strong. Veneering porcelain is around about 60 to 90 megapascals, so feldspathic porcelain is a much weaker material. But why do we get these monolithic crowns fracture? And the first reason is that it may be due to poor fabrication. You know, your dental technician may not have fabricated this correctly. They may not have handled this material correctly. They may have been adjusting the zirconia with too much heat and in, in generating a lot of stresses within the zirconia, which over time, uh, the crack start, cracks start to propagate and cause a proper fracture. The second reason is normally dentist related, and that could be due to poor preparation. And the main culprit here is insufficient thickness. You know, you haven't created enough thickness of material to give it the sufficient strength and, and, and sufficient bulk. It could be that you have undercuts, you have knife edge margins, and you may have sharp line angles of your preparation. Those sharp line angles have stress concentration areas. So all crowns, all onlays, they have a certain thickness required. And if you encroach on the minimum thickness, it weakens the mechanical properties significantly, and this may cause it to fracture. So, there are other contraindications with the, with the different preparations that we carry out. One is if you don't have sufficient thickness around the margin. If you have a feather edge, that doesn't allow a crown to actually transfer pressure to the shoulder or a chamfer. When you have a feather edge, a lot of the forces, the compressive forces, are actually kept right on those sharp line angles of the occlusal part or the coronal portion of the prep. When you have undercuts, that could be another area that's uh, causes some problems with your crowns. Another problem I see is these trough shoulders. When you've, you've carried out a, a crown preparation and you left a little lip on the shoulder, that lip uh, sometimes can break away. Uh, sometimes it's just very difficult for the ceramist to form a, a good shoulder, uh, a good marginal fit of the restoration. So a clinical tip I give dentists is to use a, a really much larger bird than your final a shoulder or chamfer preparation. So by using a slightly larger bird, you get some much smoother preparation. If you use a very thin bird, sometimes you gouge into the two. So I like to use a slightly larger bird at the end just to smooth off the preparation. You know, having sufficient thickness, you, know, you, you can use different uh, ways of assessing the thickness, you know, putty keys, uh, you know, this is here, a putty key used on a wax up, and we can peel away the layers to see how much reduction that we've done when we put it back on the prepared teeth. 
There are different uh, gauges that you can buy. Some are the sterilizable. These are disposable tabs that you can buy. If you don't buy these tabs, you can even get a bit of wax, soft wax, and get the patient to bite into the wax or bite into bite registration material and then measure the thickness just to ensure that you have sufficient thickness. And these days we have a lot of intraoral scanners which can actually gauge the reduction that you've actually carried out as well. But the, the, you know, the design faults I see, and I see because I also have a laboratory on site, and we, we have work coming from other dentists as well, and you can see some of the design faults. And one of them is this insufficient preparation. There's just not enough occlusal reduction, not enough labor reduction. There's, there's line angles that are sharp, those sharp line angles are stress concentration areas. The other area you have to be careful about is the concavity of a, a tooth, the lingual concavity of the maxillary incisors, uh, for example. In this area here, if you leave your margin in this area, this is an area that is, is actually subjected to a lot of force and a lot of stress. So try to not have your margin right at the cingulum region. And then being careful about dentine. If you're gonna use all ceramics, you may want to bond to uh, enamel. And you, if you look at Frediani's studies, uh, they've shown that if you are not bonding to dentine, there's much more failures uh, that occur when you're not bonding to, to enamel margins. So the third reason is some form of overload, some sort of mechanical trauma, micro trauma or macro trauma. So, you know, it could be that you don't have very good occlusal stability. You might have some interferences in the restorations. You got to remember ceramics very good in compressive uh, forces, but shearing force is not so good. So as a dentist, you want to control not just the preparation and the thickness, but you also have to be very careful in how you manage the occlusion and how you manage if particularly in people with parafunction or in lateral movements. So my recommendations for you as a dentist to really try and minimize crowns fracturing in your practice is firstly, you use a good lab. You know, use a good technician that you can have a good teamwork and com uh, camaraderie with that you can talk to openly. The second thing is to ensure that you have sufficient thickness of your preparation. Now, you might say, oh, you know, there was a case I didn't get enough sufficient thickness. How could you actually increase the mechanical properties of the material? And one of those, re one of those uh, methods of increasing the strength of your ceramic restoration is not to cement, but to adhesively bond the restoration. We call it the lamination effect. The lamination effect is when you bond ceramic material onto a tooth structure, you actually gain a lot of strength. It actually gains the strength of the substrate it's being bonded to. And the third um, tip I give is just be careful with occlusion. You know, it's something that sometimes we as dentists take it for granted. We, we adjust the occlusion so it's out of the bite, it's comfortable for the patient. But we need to ensure that the patient, when they move in the lateral movements, in the different chewing motions, that we are very careful that we're not subjecting the ceramic to shearing forces. Be also very careful in the anterior zone. In the anterior zone, uh, when patients chew, often they chew outside in. Uh, John Coyce talks about this, this envelope of function and how they chew from outside in. So when you, when you test those cases, get the patient to actually pretend they're chewing on something. So you see if when they're chewing like this, you know, sometimes as dentists we go, bite, tap, 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 move it side to side, forwards and back, but that's not how they actually chew. How they chew is actually outside in. So we check that envelope of function and we just see if there's any sort of streaks or marks on the articulated paper that mark the ceramic and we adjust those areas. But you have to also remember that, you know, things happen in dentistry, complications happen. So if you've never had a crown fracture, then you haven't done enough in your career. So hopefully this gives you some insight into some of the things that you see in practice and what you need to avoid and how you have to be a little bit careful in certain ways you do things. So don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.